The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submit it to God and plead it for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined, we are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. There is a tradition in Hebrew poetry that claims that those who worship idols will become like them. The psalmist echoes this tradition in Psalm 135 when he reminds the house of Israel that the gods of the nations or the ethnos or the Gentiles are of their own making and have no power to communicate of their own accord. The psalmist points to a mutually reinforcing circularity in the constitution of both the idols and their worshipers. Since these no-gods are fashioned by those who worship them, they bear the image of the idolater, while the idolater, through continual veneration of the idol, in turn bears its image. Throughout this paper, I will make the claim that whiteness is best understood as a religious system of pagan idol worship that thrives on a mutually reinforcing circularity between the image or the ideal or the form and the social constitution of those who worship it. As idolatry, whiteness must be dealt with as any such cultic system. Its high places must be torn down and its altars laid low. The purpose, therefore, of this paper is to offer a few concrete practices in which white folks must engage to begin casting down our white idols. Now, I understand that uh, the language of idolatry has often been used as a tool of the powerful against indigenous peoples, but for multiple reasons that I make apparent in the paper, I'm running it in the opposite direction here. <laughs> <laughs> 
So toward this end, I will use language of decentering to describe the posture needed for white people as we engage in these spiritual disciplines. Because white worshipers have centered ourselves in the economy of God's saving activity in the world, specific practices aimed at decentering whiteness as universally normative constitute the best path toward tearing down the altars of whiteness. Because white supremacy is arguably the original sin of the West, America, and the church, we must speak of whiteness as an effective idolatry. While whiteness has historically been fashioned by white worshipers, its cultic power is such that all flesh may be tempted to render it homage. How does one worship whiteness? By seeking to become like it, by assimilating to its form, by being enamored with its power and by internalizing its standards of beauty and rationality. To become like whiteness is to disremember the manner in which whiteness competes with the rule of reign in Jesus as a, as a site of identity constitution. Now, while I will retain language of reconciliation in this essay because of the rich biblical notion of the preeminence of divine agency that it invokes, reconciliation is not reconciliation if the normativity of whiteness is left uncontested. As Bell Hooks has noted, white people must actively work against white supremacy and for racial justice, rather than simply lament a lack of meaningful relationships with people of color. She maintains that this integrity of praxis and this longing for the other will compel white people to be part of the beloved community where diversity is a given. So therefore, this chapter and the practices I am proposing have been birthed not just from study, but from my own experiences and relationships in the ethnically diverse and socioeconomically disadvantaged community in which we've lived and ministered for 14 years. Now, although we moved into, quote, the hood in order to be missional and to engage in incarnational ministry, this journey has pushed back against these ways of imagining the movement of the gospel. It has consistently called me to be decentered, to realize that I am not the central actor in God's saving work in the world and to admit that common white assumptions about what is needed, what is right, what is healthy, and what is beautiful are constructed according to an implicit cultural hierarchy and to recognize that I am very much in need of redemption and conversion. Now, because I'm focusing on specific practices aimed at the decentering of whiteness, in today's talk, I will only be summarizing much of the conceptual apparatus that appears in the full version of this paper, so buy the book. <laughs> Now, I, I do not present my story in order to justify or condemn myself or others. Rather, I will reference a few of my experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to demonstrate that being joined in relationships of love and desire with people different than me has been the door through which God has participated in my continued conversion, or better yet, is the life of continued conversion into the radical love of the Father. Toward that end, in a lesser known essay entitled The Souls of White Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois offers a sociological analysis of whiteness that sounds notes that would later be echoed and further developed through, through the discipline of critical race theory. In this essay, Du Bois draws a distinction between white as a skin color and whiteness as a way of being in the world that had to be discovered through modernity. In tantalizingly theological terms, Du Bois describes the conversion of white folks to whiteness, a system that is, quote, the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. To develop my claim that whiteness is idolatry, I am reading Du Bois' prescient analysis in a theological register. If whiteness as a socio-political order entails a conversion and a sense of earth ownership, then it makes claims in regard to soteriology and creation theology that are at odds with the salvation history of scripture, which is why we need a deconversion. If, however, Christian witness can be reimagined through the decentering of whiteness, then the practices I am proposing may be a promising path forward. Now, before several white listeners protest that being pigmently challenged is not inherently sinful, or before several non-white listeners register suspicion at a white theologian talking about race, may I offer the caveat that I am not attempting to essentialize race by talking about color. Additionally, it should be obvious that liking white things, skinny jeans, indie rock, green bean casserole, and John Milbank, for instance, 
is not in and of itself the problem. The problem is that said particularities have been elevated as universally normative and theologically central, all the while being cloaked in conceptions of neutrality. Theologically speaking, whiteness will not be overcome through uncritical reassertions of tradition, but in learning to accept by grace a marginal seat at Christ's table. It is only in the decentering of whiteness that white particularities will be included in the body of Christ in a redemptive manner. Now, toward this end, I propose five practices in which white folks must engage to resist the sociopolitical order of whiteness. First, repentance for complicity in systemic sin. Second, learning from theological and cultural resources not our own. Third, choosing to locate our lives in places and structures in which we are necessarily guests. Fourth, tangible submission to non-white ecclesial leadership. And fifth, hearing and speaking the glory of God in unfamiliar cadences. First, white people in general and white Christians in particular must repent for complicity and systemic sin. This includes a continual recognition of the legacies of colonization, destruction of native peoples, imperialist seizures of land, the transatlantic slave trade, lynching, Jim Crow segregation, and the modern racialized criminal justice system, which have created social structures which still benefit white people and marginalize others. For instance, it is worth noting that the median household income for African-American households is still roughly 60% that of white households, a figure which aligns almost perfectly with the three-fifths compromise of 1787, which valued black bodies at 60% that of white bodies. But perhaps more importantly, our confession entails recognizing that none of this marginalization would have been possible without our assumptions about the universality of our traditions and the manner in which those assumptions effectively center whiteness as constitutive of the Christian body and the body politic. Now, when I use language of repentance, I'm not referring to what is commonly understood as white guilt, the paralyzing sense of shame that would keep us from working against the effects of white power and privilege. While conservative claims about white innocence or the refusal to take seriously systemic white sin and privilege are historically illiterate, progressive white guilt also often functions as an exercise in self-justification. White innocence reads whiteness as sinless and pure, while white guilt reads whiteness as the willing sacrifice for the sake of the world. Both ideological stances subtly read white folks into a Christological trope, therefore reaffirming the centrality of the white Jesus, whom J. Cameron Carter calls the cultural reflex Christ. Both pictures envision white folks as white saviors. Both events similar self-obsessed postures. As a scholar practitioner, nobody needs my tears or my enlightenment. Rather, we must identify the ways in which the structures in which we participate retain power for white folks, and then we must work toward the redistribution of power even at our own, even at our own expenses. As a friend of mine recently commented, some of these woke folk need to take a nap. <laughs> Now, moving away from white self-obsession also moves the conversation away from focusing solely on personal racial animus as a matter of the will to focusing instead on what Willie Jennings identifies as the collective racialized imagine char imagination characteristic of whiteness. See, this is a way of avoiding the gridlock of trying to ascertain the supposed purity or impurity of one's intentions and instead beginning to speak about what is. For not only is purity of will an illusion, but searching after it tends to function as a practice of works righteousness antithetical to the gospel. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I said that searching after it tends to function as a practice of works righteousness antithetical to the gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer compellingly maintains that humanity's desire for the knowledge of good and evil is rooted in the idolatrous temptation to be like God. Therefore, if this is the case, then focusing on intentions or will primarily tends to be an exercise in white navel gazing that further ensconces white folks in self-deification. White folks need not protest that our hearts are in the right place, but instead must focus how, on how the priv economies of privilege we have constructed marginalize others. For instance, imagine how much difference it would make in relationships marked by difference if even a fraction of the grace that white folks extend to each other in regard to intentions were extended to all people. For instance, we as white people are often defensive when confronted with something offensive we have said and proceed to protest that we didn't mean it that way. 
But if our ignorance has hurt others, it doesn't matter how we mean it. At the invitation of pastors with whom I am in relationship, I often preach in historically African-American churches. And early on in this journey, I once attempted to use the plural you by addressing a congregation as you folks. A mother in the church took me aside after the service and explained to me that although she knew I didn't intend to racially categorize the worshiping body, it would be interpreted that way if I continued to talk in this manner. Another time, an African-American woman who sits on a board of which I'm a member publicly confronted me with the way a popular community development book I was recommending pictured poverty as a black urban phenomenon. In these and countless other times, I've had the choice to apologize and change rather than dig in my heels and protest that I meant well. What if we as white people saw correction and anger as a gift given to us by people of color? A gift that signals a desire to relate in a more healthy manner. And what if we reciprocated that grace by giving others the benefit of the doubt when what is said makes us feel prickly and vulnerable? See, the repentance of which I'm speaking is not a punctiliar confession of the sort that is had during events planned to encourage racial reconciliation, nor even the presenting of papers at missiology lectures. (laughs) Although perhaps good starts, the inherent danger in focusing primarily on getting race questions right is that white folks can subtly define ourselves as good white people or the sort of people on the in crowd of race relations be pleased with ourselves and then be done. For example, Messianic Jewish theologian Mark Kinzer maintains that what are needed more than Gentile Christians' apologies for their anti-Semitic relationships to Jews are concerted efforts that dismantle the supersessionism that has marginalized non-European flesh for centuries. And you see, the same can be said with, in regard to the need for white people to move beyond self-centered introspection toward working in solidarity with people of color to dismantle whiteness, which may mean, which may mean some of us saying things or taking stands that cost us jobs, cost us promotion, or getting ourselves out of the way, working ourselves out of jobs to give other people places in in structures that have uh, been constructed to favor white folks. You see, white people need to learn anew that we are nothing more than creatures and certainly not creators. Again, in Du Bois' poignant words observing the white body, I quote, We whose shame, humiliation, and deep insult his aggrandizement so often involved were never deceived. We looked at him clearly with world-old eyes and saw simply a human thing, weak and pitiable and cruel, even as we are and were. If the message of the gospel is that humans are simply creatures awaiting the justification and judgment of God, then the universalizing tendencies of white folks' often optimistic theological anthropologies must be chastened, which is a claim I will develop in the next section. When we as white folks think that Western civilization is the apex of what it means to be human, we necessarily engage others from a self-imposed position of condescension, no matter how much we talk about inclusion and diversity. This indicates that we believe our theologies, our preaching, our art forms, and our worship practices are the standards, while the practices of people of color are specialist interests, ethnic experiences, missions initiatives, or expressions of diversity. Now, many will note that I'm implicitly drawing on Jennings' contention that the theological deformity of supersessionism is constitutive of the racialized imagination, but it's not my my goal to reconstruct that genealogy in detail, but rather my contention is that the tradition or traditions of Western Christian orthodoxy, follow me here, while not monolithic in a reductionist sense, are nonetheless best understood as one particular enculturation or cluster of Hellenized appropriations of faith in the Jewish Messiah and should not be read uncritically in a universalizing fashion. Now, I find compelling Justo Gonzalez's claim that the Nicene Christian tradition more sufficiently reflected on the doctrinal implications of the claim that the Jewish Jesus of Nazareth is the savior of the world than the comparatively over-systematized heresies of the first few centuries of Gentile Christian faith. At the same time, Gonzalez notes the psychological, sociological, and racial implications of the Nicene tradition's use of language and formulations foreign to the biblical witness. Mm. 
Similarly, Kinzer compellingly demonstrates that both the patristic luminaries and the conciliar formulations went to great lengths to define Christianity as a rig religious system distinct from and even opposed to Judaism and continued Jewish adherence to Torah. In other words, from the uh, um, uh, Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, the burden of proof in, in patristic literature switched from the burden of proof being on Gentiles to joining with the Jewish people to the burden of proof switching to Jews to see if they could worship their own Messiah as Gentiles. Mm. And this was the work of, by and large, the Western tradition. And if we read the Christian tradition then as a particular enculturation of faith in the Jewish Messiah, we can read it as both helpful and problematic. That's why we're free to read with the communion of saints in both generous and critical ways. Theological projects that derive their energy primarily from reclamations of the tradition often underestimate the extent to which their doctrinal systems and ecclesial practices reenact the memory of white pagan gods of race and religion. This theological hubris has far-reaching implications for how we think about mission, race, wealth, and criminality, and is the core of the systemic sin of which white Christians must repent. This means that common Western missiological questions related to protecting against syncretism in the proclamation of the gospel are usually fundamentally flawed because they tend to position Western Gentile Christians as capable of judging the relative cultural merits of others while forgetting our own cultural situatedness. Number two, white Christians must learn from theological and cultural resources, not our own. The centering of whiteness is concomitant with situating the, situating the white male heterosexual abled body as constitutive of the Christian body, both individual bodies and the body politic. By making this claim, I'm not suggesting that race, gender, and disability are interchangeable sites of identity, even less that they should be reified, but rather that whiteness tends to orbit around maleness and ableism at all as an ideal form of the human. Therefore, my claim that whiteness is idolatry is not a suggestion that all white folks experience white privilege in the same manner. And this is important to recognize, especially as we think about, uh, and I'm not justifying their racism, but marginalized, impoverished, rural white folks who have been taught to think they are better than somebody else simply because of race. We need to carefully distinguish this matter. So it's not that white privilege is born in the same manner by all people, but rather that the benefits and burdens of whiteness are leveraged and borne by many different groups of people in various ways and for various projects, an insight that is pursued in recent scholarship related to intersectionality. It is through learning from theological and cultural tra uh, traditions that are not white, read that are not, quote, traditioned accounts by only white males, that white folks can begin a process of decentering our own theological and philosophical presuppositions as universally normative, while seeing whiteness for what it is, a weak and pitiable longing to be divine. Now, I'm not going to read this section in detail because I want to respect the time. In this section, I, I just deal briefly with uh, uh, Latin American liberation theology, uh, uh, several African American church traditions, feminist and womanist thought. There are plenty of great resources out there uh, to, to different schools of thought. I demonstrate how I juxt, or I, I, I'm going to demonstrate right now how I juxtapose personal examples with the conceptual apparatus that I'm, that I'm building. If you want to know more about uh, some of the apparatus that I'm building, you can also uh, get, get my book, uh, Another Capitalist uh, uh, Plug. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but since I've already given a few examples of how decentering whiteness can work in regard to institutions, intentions, and ecclesial practices, let me just briefly demonstrate uh, uh, ecclesially how I've had to think through uh, uh, um, uh, the, the manner in which feminism and womanism ne needs to and does uh, decenter uh, uh, white maleness. Uh, so for example, in, in our local church, I like to pat myself on the back for the ways in which I've worked to empower women in leadership. Feel great. However, I regularly need to be reminded of the ways in which empowerment still orbits around conceptions of male centrality. You see, several women in pastoral and lay leadership at our church recently explained to me that while listening to what women have to say, I often repackage their insights in my own words in a way that renders their voices silent. Yes. Now, I didn't recognize that I had in effect been translating their speech into a male register and in so doing, claiming their contributions as my own. Yes. It hurts to recognize the ways in which we deploy male privilege and white privilege. Yes. 
However, the tragedy is women and people of color being hurt by white males as we move ourselves to the spotlight at their expense. Thankfully, thankfully, these women of God corrected me in love and are helping me restructure my discourse and the way I carry myself in meetings. Toward that end, in both study and practice, I have experienced disability theology as a very fruitful and underemphasized theological trajectory for resisting whiteness. Allow me to speak to this just ever so briefly. Robust theologies of disability show that traditional theological anthropologies have often implied that there are, quote, real humans at the center against which, quote, marginal humans are compared. In other words, prejudicial theological assumptions about race often rest on a disability description of people of color and women. Men. In this center periphery game, there are normal white people and then there are ethnic black and brown people. In resisting anthropology centered on human capacity or what Brian Brock calls best case anthropologies, disability theology calls into question the existence of an ideal form of the human. I've been struck by how much even at this conference we are still retaining language of imago dei that is basically a relationship of being that points to some, some level of capacity or or communicable attributes with the divine as constitutive of, of humanity rather than some other way of looking at the Imago Dei. Sometimes I don't get asked back places. Oh God, help us. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't, woo, okay. When our church moved into an historic bu church building on the dividing line of segregation in our town, I was attracted to the ramifications this location had for racial unity, while all the while assuming that the building would be welcoming to people with disabilities because it had an elevator. I did not first consult the mem members of our church with physical disabilities. A woman with cerebral palsy led me through the building and showed me how our lift did not work well for people with disabilities, how the pews forced people with disabilities into a segregated disability section, how the doorways were too narrow for independent movement and how all of this combined to form an exclusionary environment. She then invited me to spend a day with her riding around our town in a motorized wheelchair, learning how even ADA accessibility does not guarantee a welcoming environment. Now, while I had asked her to lead accessibility issues at our church and felt good about myself, <laughs> it took a tearful and angry interchange to help me recognize how, like race, disability is a site of identity that encourage, incurs marginalization in many church communities. And then for, it took that for our church to begin learning from disability communities and shifting the priorities of our budget to reflect the need for increased accessibility. Therefore, disability calls into question ableism as human normativity and shines a light on how racial segregation has often operated according to a logic of disability. Now finally, in this section, in reclaiming... <laughs> Finally, in reclaiming the potential of Christian theology to subvert cults of race, gender, ability, and nation, the Christian tradition itself can be reread in generous ways. In fact, a convincing case can be made that limitations notwithstanding, Christian tradition has often been more affirming of the created dignity of humanity than both ancient Greco-Roman society and modern secular humanism. Now, while justly criticizing the tradition for the manner in which it has tended to universalize its own particularities and forget its own peripheral place in the divine drama of salvation, it is a process of learning from non-white theological resources that encourages us to likewise act charitably in refusing to anachronistically stereotype patristic thought or render it monolithic. The insights about Christology and theological anthropology, ap apology, I apologize, raised in these diverse treatments of Christian identity highlight a crucial question. Whose Jesus are Christians worshiping? Is he the white Jesus of the West, the aesthetically idealized ur-human into whose flesh pagans may be grafted? Is he the triumphant Christ of colonization, political empires, military campaigns, targeted policing, and mass incarceration? Or is he the Jesus whom Ted Smith proclaims as beaten, chained, enslaved, lynched, and raped at gunpoint, whom James Cohn calls the Jesus of the spirituals and Fannie Lou, ha Fanny, Fanny Lou Hamer, the Moltmannian crucified God? 
If white Christians are to meet this latter Jesus, we must learn from theological and cultural resources, not our own. Specifically, white male able-bodied Christians cannot claim to be missional without experiencing how God's mission to us is embodied in theologies of liberation from people of color, women, and people with disabilities. Third, white folks must choose to locate our lives in places and structures not our own. Place matters, it is identity constituting. In Bardian terms, it is through participation in the particularities of the created order that a human recognizes that she is a creature and that she is this particular creature and not another. Of all people, Christians must recognize that we are strangers and aliens who necessarily enter new physical and social spaces as guests. However, Christian tradition has often seen its vocation as one of hospitality, conceived in a way that positions Christians as hosts to the world, as arbiters more than recipients of divine hospitality. And now, while this may sound innocuous, and while it may not be completely without merit, by reading ourselves into the center rather than the periphery of the salvation narrative, white Christians have tended and still tend to enter places not our own as divinely appointed owners who think we know better what is needed in those spaces than the people who already live there. Such a conceptuality cannot but Inter encourage paternalistic assessments that orbit around a racialized hierarchy. For instance, consider how Christian mission has functioned as a methodology of evaluation and social control. Non-Christians and people of color who are already Christians are often treated as objects of white mission or become forced recipients of white welcome. Now, while the positive legacies of Western mission include a more global recognition of the story of salvation in Israel's Messiah and at times even resistance to empire and solidarity with indigenous peoples, its worst legacies are colonization, genocide, and slavery. Modern mission trips, cult cross-cultural experiences, community development work, and urban ministries of the sort of which I am a part are not automatically exempt from the similarly dangerous pat paternalistic tendencies that we've seen. Only by entering as guests, which means learning as much as we can about a place and its cultural traditions, learning from our hosts what is appropriate. Can Christians in general and white people in particular practice a witness consonant with the one who was a stranger on earth? White hospitality often forecloses Christian reciprocity. A few years after moving into our neighborhood, the church I pastor was still not a very diverse body. I knew this was not the reality to which God had called us, and I would pray in tears and agony for this to change. However, the Lord convicted me that I was praying for reconciliation on my own terms rather than asking for our city to be reconciled to one another whether or not I was at the center of that work. I was asking and acting according to the missional imagination bequeathed to me by my Christian faith. In effect, I was lamenting that I had not been successful in leading the joining across ethnic and socioeconomic lines, which revealed the extent to which I thought of myself as host. It was soon thereafter that God allowed me to meet leaders of color in our community who were willing to take me under their, under their wing. I had to learn to be a guest. See, a mark of whiteness is the ability to think of created place in terms of a mandate for earth ownership. Whiteness entails thinking that all the earth should be open to us while simultaneously forgetting that many places are not open to or safe for people of color. Fear of immigrants, the repeal of DACA, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and America First doctrines are manifestations of believing that the land belongs to us. One need only think of Trayvon Martin's fatal transgression of gated space to recognize the manner in which racialized policing of place has become ubiquitous in modernity. Throughout the world, space has often been divided up and parceled out by the dictates of capitalist markets which have historically been oriented towards segregationist practices and the alignment of relative socioeconomic status with racialized hierarchies. If capitalism is constituted by what Daniel Bell calls economies of desire, and if whiteness is best understood as a self-constituting cult of worship, they are in effect made for each other. In this state of affairs, we plan the locations of our homes, our work, our faith communities, and our children's schools according to perceived values of market potential, safety, or desirability without recognizing how those factors have become inherently racialized. White folks often engage in this constellation of choices as if it is an unassailable good and then maintain that we should not be implicated in the fact that our ecclesial communities are segregated and homogenous. <laughs> 
For instance, white folks have historically moved further and further away from communities of color while citing colorblind reasons like home resale value, high-performing schools, proximity to recreational activities, consumerist centers, and the cult of the American nuclear family. We have ignored the fact that pulling economic resources out of communities contributes to an inequitable distribution of resources. And I've experienced this in multiple ways in our urban community as people come into our community, especially folks from suburban and rural communities, especially white folks who are uneasy or fearful because of society's perceptions about race, place, violent crime, and criminality. Now, while I have experienced violence in our community and even a bullet coming through our window, I must say that the big difference in my urban community that is ethnically diverse is that the educational resources, the economic distribution of resources, the opportunities for employment and the way the police mil are militarized and the way they conduct our urban communities as a war zone are the biggest differences. Wow. Now, yeah. once the world has been fashioned according to our liking, it costs white folks very little and means very little to claim that we are welcoming or desiring of diversity. We have ordered space so that the requisite assimilation to whiteness carries with it both desirable socioeconomic benefits and the lamentable experience of cultural disintegration. Rather than a Christian hospitality concomitant to whiteness, Christian guesting is a much more promising practice for joining in relationships marked by difference. Christian guesting requires that white Christians intentionally live our lives in places in which we must be offered hospitality, in which we, in which we must learn how to be led. Now, I am moving toward a conclusion here. Let me just briefly give fourth and fifth practices. A fourth practice is intrinsically connected to the third and helps to further clarify the nature of Christian guesting. White folks must practice tangible submission to black and brown ecclesial leadership. This is a necessary spiritual discipline for white folks. We must join churches or ministry associations in which we are a minority and which are led by people of color. I recently told students when I was speaking in chapel at Taylor uh, at, on, a, on a world outreach day, you know, maybe take a break from going to the inner city ministry you're volunteering with and reading to African-American children, but instead go join a black church somewhere. Um, that didn't play very well either. Now, <laughs> In the church I pastor, the shift from a fairly homogenous worshiping body to a community diverse at every level of leadership began after I joined African American ministry associations. I asked the bishop of an historically African American church in our community that was engaged in justice initiatives long before we got there to mentor me and then joined him in his community development work. And I, I, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I, let me say that as I have joined work that was already happening, and submitted to the leadership of people of color, I've been welcomed with love that cannot be expressed. And it was that that helped our church grow into a community better reflective of the diversity of the kingdom. Now, I'm not here speaking of the sort of enforced submission historically demanded of black, brown, or female bodies by white males. For instance, the language of submission must be differentiated carefully with regard to female and male bodies. Rather, I am speaking of voluntary submission to one another with only Christ as head. Instead of abandoning the language of submission, I, pr I propose reclaiming this biblical notion in a way that subverts objectification and points to mutuality. In much the same way that I'm trying to reclaim language of reconciliation and the tradition in both sub subversive and redemptive ways, I'm suggesting that submission be reconsidered in ways that encourage mutual vulnerability. If we don't do this, we risk being left with little more than individualist moral autonomy and the warring of identity factions. Now, mutuality does not mean that women and people of color must be vulnerable to white males unilaterally, but that vulnerability on the part of white males can help to open up more spaces where marginalized people are safe to be themselves and diverse people are free to open up to one another. So for instance, as I've opened myself to criticism, women, people of color, and people with disabilities have welcomed me, led me, and even followed me in ways that could have been risky for them. For white males whose bodies usually take up space without fear of marginalization or objectification, submission means rediscovering the body of Christ through following the members of the body whose bodies have been encroached upon by whiteness and maleness. Fifth and finally, white Christians must practice hearing and speaking the glory of God in unfamiliar cadences. You see, the gift of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost enabled people from every nation under heaven to hear each of us in his own native language, in our own tongues, the mighty works of God. To be addressed by the word of God means first to hear rather than to speak. For white Gentiles to listen first reminds us that we are first recipients, not arbiters of divine grace. This does not preclude God calling us to speak and speak we must when called. Yeah. 
but it is a reminder that we must think of ourselves first as hearers and thereby become accustomed to listening to others. When the church imagines the call to proclamation as her primary calling rather than the call to joining, the call to reception is easily precluded. Speech acts are performative. The meaning of words cannot be removed from the interplay of speaker and hearer in particular cultural locations. Our speech and our way of being in the world are mutually articulating. You see, the process of which I am speaking takes time. It means being hosted in a community such that one begins to recognize, appreciate, and participate in the worship of the God of Abraham in linguistic cadences not one's own. It means more than occasionally attending a cross-cultural worship experience because it is fun or interesting. For example, as Deanna Watkins Dickerson has observed, when white folks attend worship services in historically black religious communities, we are often engaged in surveillance more than participation. Now, while experiencing dislocation is unavoidable when initially pursuing reconciliation, the temptation to assuage these feelings of unfamiliarity by quickly moving to evaluation of the other precludes the greater experience of shared mutuality that can come in the process. You see, when encountering previously unfamiliar modes of discourse and expressions of embodiment, white folks must learn to practice a sustained involvement rather than exercising the ethnographic gaze. As I am a guest in a community not my own, as I submit to others different than myself, I begin to recognize what love and desire sound like when spoken to me in ways with which I was not previously familiar. As my ears are attuned to the glory of God being shouted and sung and preached and whispered, I imagine the Father of Jesus differently than before. I fumblingly attempt to reciprocate the voices of love and desire I hear speaking over me. I begin to theologize differently, to preach differently, to pray differently, and to love differently. I'm not speaking here of repackaging an immutable message. I'm not saying that we need to try to learn another language to relate better to people different than us, but rather that when we recognize Jesus in ways in which we had not known him, our white idols begin to be cast down. Yeah. We begin to talk different, to think different, to worship different. Yes, the way I preach is change. The way I preach changes. I may have even found a little hoop and a little call and response in me. But it is because of love and conversion, not because of religious marketing or diversity packaging. You see, it is easier and more comfortable to be affirmed in one's own identity by living life with people from similar ideological and cultural backgrounds. However, for white people to continue to do so entails continuing to worship our own white images instead of Jesus. And if we were at church right now, I would tell you about Jesus. But we're not at church, so I can't tell you about Jesus. But if we were at church, I would tell you. <laughs> I would tell you not about the white Jesus, but I would tell you about the Jesus whom scripture says his hair is like the wool of sheep and his feet are like burnished bronze, if we were at church. <laughs> you see, if we were at church, I would tell you about the Jesus that it was said of him from Nazareth, can anything good come from there? But I'm not at church, so I won't do that. But if I was at church, I would tell you. I would tell you today about the Jesus who was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. I would tell you about the Jesus whom they lifted up high and who went down low. I would tell you about the Jesus who came for even a white male like me. See, life together with a diverse variety of people means that our own prejudices and paternalisms will be regularly checked and confronted. And while this is not comfortable and having our ignorance on full display, takes some vulnerability. If we faithfully work through this mess, we will experience an unparalleled and unexpected community of difference and beauty. Amen. Oh God, you will not understand the beauty that is experienced in working through this mess. So I thank Fuller for, for putting this on. Only when our lives are intertwined with others in relationships marked by difference, can we learn to recognize the word of God meeting us in the other? Together, we proclaim the end of mission as we tear down the altars of whiteness and lay low its idolatrous high places. As together we worship the living word, whiteness is decentered as a site of identity constitution, and white people are grafted back in as simply human. This then is mission. <laughs> 
decentering whiteness so as to be joined to others who are also making the journey to a center not of our own making. Thank you.